Okay, um, this afternoon what I'm going to talk to you about is, is the cloud and what the cloud is. Um, we'll start off with a bit of, of what, what the cloud is, but then hopefully really focus on how it's, it differs in terms of our lives, how we work. And then we'll end up talking a bit about how it impacts teaching and learning and where the big differences are. Now, if you were here earlier, you would have seen this, this video running. And you might recognise it as the Windows Update screen, which runs and it runs. And often you turn your computer on, you sit there waiting, because it's downloaded it and it goes on. I can send this video afterwards, it does last 10 hours. So you can, if you want to use this as a screen saver, use that one. But if you've seen that, hopefully what I'll talk to you about this afternoon is show why things are changing and why hopefully this won't be part of our lives much longer. Now, when I was playing this presentation, I came across this quote, I really liked it. When we think about technology, I think about things that are new to me, things that have changed. But this quote I think exemplifies it. Now, for our students, our children, often things we take for granted, or things they take for granted, they don't consider to be technology. For us, electricity is not technology. We turn the light switch on, the lights come on, there's no great magic to that. We accept it's going to happen, we expect it. And when we've got a power cut, it causes us issues. For students going to school now, they've always had the internet. So for them, the internet is not technology, it's just a thing. As they expect to turn the tap and water comes out, as they expect to turn the light switch on, it's just something they, they expect, they're used to. And they're the same sort of reaction when it's not there. And so it's the same reaction too. When the internet's down, it's as bad as cutting the electricity off. Because my life revolves around it. So, that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, this is a bit about my lifetime. In my lifetime, I've gone through the stage of having work, things saved on floppy disks, then got quite excited when I went to college, had my first modem, and you could spend 20 minutes downloading a pixelated picture, and you get halfway, and it wouldn't work, you'd have to start a game, and then discover it wasn't the picture you were looking for in the first place. We then moved on to things like MSN Messenger, and the excitement of being able to talk to someone in America quite randomly, not really having much to say, but you go through connecting people around the world. And then I remember the, the Apple Mac coming out where they, they cut out the floppy disk drive and they said in the future people are going to start saving things on the internet and using the modem to connect things and we wouldn't be saving things locally. And they had the foresight to start taking the floppy disk drive away and planning how you might save things di differently. Now, one time I introduced you to a game heard before is digital disruptors. So this is when a technology comes out or there's a, a fundamental change within a marketplace. So this happened with the iPod. When the iPod came out, it changed music. Now, Apple didn't invent MP3s. They didn't invent digital music. What they did was they put together a product or something that changed how we listen to music. We stopped going from tapes where we might put together a playlist and organize it in a linear sequence to suddenly music was digital files and you could pick up and play anything you want. And you could rejig them, you could skip it, you could move around, and you could do things with it that you couldn't do before. And suddenly the marketplace changed. Other people got on board too. But that's where digital disruptors come in there, and they shift things around. And hopefully this afternoon, we'll show you lots of those. Now I have put a little caveat on there. This afternoon I'm gonna talk about different technologies. There are alternatives. So in the same way I'm not showing you different MP3 players, there are always those things. So if I exemplify it with one, that's suggesting all, and that's just the market. So let's get a bit te techie first. What is the cloud, or so where is the cloud? And when we say cloud, actually, physically, what is it? Now, this is a server farm. A server farm is where cloud, cloud storage is. So a server farm is measured in stamps. And essentially, what you've got is some storage with a computer, with some back, uh, backups, and they're all identical. And they're called, they're measured in stamps because effectively they're just stamped out copies of each other. And so a company will buy them, Amazon will buy them, they'll install them in, they'll plug them in, they've got air conditioning there, and essentially that, that machine will be up and running and there'll be multiple copies of it just sat there in a server farm with some technicians often going around on bikes and things because these places are massive, and they'll look after these things, and at the end of their life, a life cycle, they'll then bid them. Now, the smallest one you're looking at is probably between 800 and 1,000 stamps. That's the smallest ones. These are massive, great places, take lots of power, and they exist all around the world. So when we talk about cloud storage, often we're not too worried about where it's stored. There are some issues 
with where things are stored in certain instances, but normally when we're working, when we're using things, we're not too worried actually where our work goes. What we want to know is that it works, that it's stored, that it's somewhere secure, and it's backed up. And they're placed around the world, so that, that way, wherever you're connecting, you connect to somewhere local, there's backup copies, so if one goes down, it exists in a different space, and you can continue working. But largely today, we're not too worried about actually how this works. What we want to know is how it's changed our lifestyle. What does it do for us? Now, if you talk to our, sorry, our GCSE students about computing, they, they might say, well, this is just thin client technology. This is 80s technology, it's been around for a long time. And if you say thin client, what you're talking about is a server, a bit like we have within the GFM. We've got a server, we connect computers to it, and essentially they work off it. And if you think it's that, then that's essentially how the cloud does work in a sense. But it's how we use it, it's how we interact with it that really changes. With thin client, all of these machines don't have any software on it, all of it runs off there. And that's that sort of set up. But the cloud goes beyond there. And it goes beyond there because the devices we're using has changed. We use loads of different devices. So, you may have seen Google, Google Glass when that came out. That way you can look and see things. With that, there's no storage on it. It's all stored in the cloud. It's all stored in those remote servers. When you talk to your Alexa, Alexa answers your questions within seconds. And it's doing that not because the data is stored on it. It's because it's finding the data. It's delivering it back to you. You may have seen the Amazon Loop. So you can now wear Alexa that's coming out shortly. So you can have a ring, you tap a button, you talk to it, hold it to your ear, and it tells you the answer. So you've got these things becoming really, really portable. And it's the same with their glasses, they've got Alexa built in, so you can just literally talk out loud, it'll play music straight to your ear. So all of these technologies rely on the cloud, and that's some of the ways it's changing what we do. Now, if you've travelled here, you may have been using cloud technologies to get here. This was, about two hours ago, the map of local area using Waze. And what Waze does is it works with everyone using the same technology. Maps and things aren't stored there, everything gets hosted on the cloud, so the data all goes up there. So as people drive around, you can see around ports we've got red lines. This is indicating in real time that these roads are running really slowly. You've got these Waze users that flash around, and these are all people running the app simultaneously. So around the globe, people are using this technology where they make use of the cloud to understand their better, area better, rather than having to study the AA roadmap, go through their plan your journey, hope for the best, and arrive in Cornwall at six in the morning when there was no traffic. This way you can see in real time what's going on with certain routes that are navigating around there. And it's doing your collaborative work. By everyone sharing data, sharing stuff about them, it's allowing us to do that. Now, I'm going to change tack a few times as we go through this to try and talk you through the cloud and how it differs. Now, if I was to talk to you about how you pay for these things, you'd probably come up with one or two answers. It's fairly possible you'll say you either pay a monthly subscription for it or you pay for what you use. Some people might turn around and say actually they generate a bit of their own electricity, but often that goes back to the main grid anyway and gets stored. But largely that's how we pay for these services. And if you think about the current generation, we're renting more and more things. We've moved to a situation where lots of people rent cars. <coughs> in London you can go and rent bikes, you can rent things. Now, this is really convenient for us. If you move to London, if you want to rent a flat, you can rent a flat for as much, much time as you want, from a day on Airbnb to a month to a year. You can rent it, you can rent the clothes, so that way you don't have to wear the same thing twice, you don't have to go shopping, it can be delivered to you. You can rent these things and avoid that cost of ownership, having to look after these things, store these things, have these evaluations on things. You just get to pay for what you use. When you think about Uber, Uber, you go on there, you download the app, you can see the car coming towards you. Now this only works with cloud-based technology. You're not worried about how to find that cab. You're worried about how that cab gets to you, literally by entering your postcode, it shows you in real time, on a map, where it is, how much it's going to cost, it works it all out for you. And the reason this is slightly different in terms of technology, you haven't got someone at the end of the phone, picking the phone up, saying, yes, I might have a taxi in three hours, it's going to cost this much, estimating for you, and a real person doing that. You've got a computer in the background, delivering it to you far faster, in real time, 
and you can t track that taxi right from where it is currently all the way to where you are and at the end of it it shows it disappearing off. And this is some of the ways that cloud technology is changing our lives. Now going back to where I started, children nowadays, this isn't technology. Yeah, this is just what they've grown up with. So the first time they start using taxis, well, why wouldn't you just use this? Because they've got smartphones, they're using it. So for children nowadays, there's nothing clever with this. There's nothing particularly exciting. They look at a map, it's there. Spotify. Now, if anyone that knows me, there's a lot, quite a nice vinyl collection. I love my records. I've got a sort of romantic side where actually picking up an album, taking it out of the sleeve, putting it on, hearing the crackle. There's a touch point to that. But most of my music I listen to on Spotify. Spotify went to another stage where essentially we moved from a stage where we had an album, we had a playlist in order, to suddenly you just want to pick up a tune, play it straight away. And you're not too bothered about where it's stored. The first track could be stored in France, second track in America. As long as it plays, it plays when you want it, as and when you want it. You can share it with people. You're not too worried about how it gets there. It doesn't even take up storage on your device because it's just playing in real time without any delays, it's just streamed straight to you. And again, you talk to children, you ask them about their Alexas, they talk to Alexa, they tell it to play a tune, and it just plays. And there's no magic to that, that's just how it is. So Blockbuster, Blockbuster Friday night used to be a lovely time, you'd go down there with the family, you'd take out the film, go through and choose it, possibly agree, order a pizza, you'd sit down together, you'd watch a film. Whereas now we start up Netflix, and I don't know about you, but if it's not playing in about five seconds of choosing it, it's a <laughs> so we're used to this on demand, wanting it exactly where you are at within seconds. And this is going to change again because PlayStation, they've got a PlayStation. PlayStation are great. Video games used to be great. You could buy a cartridge, stick it in, press play, and it would play. Nowadays, you buy a game, stick it in, and then you download. And you wait for a while for it to download. Every now and then, you have to download the system's update. The cloud's changing that. So, Google Stadia is coming out in November. Google Stadia is going to stream it in real time, just like using your Netflix. So with this, there's no more waiting. So children at the moment are used to downloading an update for a game, doing all that. Soon they won't be used to that. Soon they'll get on, they'll play it. I've been up in the IT technician's office, they've been doing some beast testing on some of those, trying it out, and it works. So literally, you buy a game, you pick up your handset, you start playing. You walk away, you go to your laptop, you keep playing your games. So it doesn't matter where you are, you're playing in real time, on any device, you don't need an expensive console, all you need is either a little dongle to attach to the TV, or any device you've got, and you can just get on and start playing. And that's where we're going. So, I did say I was going to talk about education. We talked a lot about your lifestyles, your children's lifestyles, children around, and how they experience it. But how is it going to change actually what happens in terms of our learning? And I'm going to suggest we're already there. If you want to learn to play guitar, you can go online. Fender's got their own course. At any point, you can log in and you can start playing. You can watch the videos, pause them, play back in your own time. You can do that anywhere you are, whether it's on a smartphone. And you don't have to wait to download the whole program, you can go on there. If you want to go fix, fix, fix your um, kind of a Ferrari, it's not difficult, you used to be able to get a Haynes manual out, you go through your Haynes manual, you spend ages studying the pictures, going through it, it was a reliable way of doing it. But now, literally, you can go onto YouTube and you can watch someone doing it, watch them talking through the nuts and bolts. And if one course is too difficult, you go to a different one, you watch somebody else that's done it in a slightly different way, and they talk you through it. And there's literally sites pretty much for everything. And it doesn't take away from the fact that actually we're humans, working together one-to-one -one is a great way of learning. But it's a backup for that. It's a way of changing what we're doing. It's a way of looking at things differently. So rather than just relying on single resources, we've got multiple resources, all of it in real time, all of it there when we want it. Udemy is an eye course. Now, I was thinking about this and thinking, oh, it's not rocket science. Well, actually, for £12, you can go on there in real time, you can be learning rocket science <laughs> from your smartphone. And I saw this quote a while ago. This, this quote came up, so in case you can't read for that. So you study for 15 years, but then you find out an early teenager who learned uh, Viewjet.js in two months on Udemy has made a fortune on an app more than you can make in a career. 
And fundamentally, it's where we are. There is so much learning to be had out there, so much accessible. These courses set up that you can do in real time. That students or anyone that's interested in something can learn it, can learn university level courses. I spent a little while doing a MOOC. In case you haven't heard of a MOOC, they're massive online learning communities. And with that, I was able to go to an American university virtually and learn. I had lectures delivered to me online, I collaborated with other people, I learned how to program a language, and I did loads of really interesting stuff. All, all collaboratively, all in times that suited me. So some of the lectures were real time, they were live streamed, other lectures were recorded, other work you do pre reading, and it's really interesting. You may have seen some heard of Harrow recently. So Harrow is setting up their own online global school. They've identified with technology that they can take some of their expertise and put these things online. There's other schools, like a friend of mine that works for Inter High, and she's a science teacher and she delivers her lessons from home. So it's a really interesting way because with that school, children can be anywhere in the world. They've still got their traditional timetable, they still learn, so they can interact with her in real time. But then they can go away, they can do their additional work, they can do their different studies wherever they want. So whether they're on a yacht cruising around the world, the only criteria is got internet access, but as long as they've got that, then they can learn anywhere. And that's all made possible with cloud computing. There'd be no way of literally connecting up all these children just with cables. There needs to be some sort of infrastructure to help that. I said, I said MOOCs before, at Bay House we use Hegarty Maths, there's GCSE Pod, you haven't come across Linda.com, massive great resources, massive great banks of learning materials that we've got accessible to us. And all this is made possible with the plan. Now, within the GFM we're using the G Suite. The G Suite are online learning tools. So tools that we can learn, we can work collaboratively with. Now, there's different tools, there's different things, there's different options out there. The interesting thing with these tools is suddenly we're in a world where it doesn't matter what the students own. It doesn't matter whether they've got the most basic laptop or they may have been shopping to Apple at £50,000. Uh, that one of the technicians is probably looking at this, hoping that someone's going to treat them to it. <laughs> but essentially, we've got a £50,000 Apple computer there. Fundamentally, though, if they're a GFM student using it, and they're using it these types of technology, the experience will be the same. We're leveling things out to say actually it doesn't matter whether you've got loads of access at home, as long as you can get online, whether it's on a smartphone, whether it's on a tablet, whether it's in a, a hundred pound computer, you can get on there, you can do your work, you can interact in the same way. Without the process of having to download loads of stuff, sign into certain things, we're trying to make things as simple as possible because fundamentally we just want to bring people together. Whether it's bringing students together, whether it's bringing students and teachers together, it's that collaboration, that working together without barriers is what I think we're aiming for. And when you're looking at this and you're looking for companies that do the same thing, you know, I've been around and get some questions about you know, things, things like working capacity, security, like in Google, is this an option, is this a viable way to go? And with this, you can see these companies out there, all of these people use Google as their tools. Now, there's loads of different tools out there. You know, Apple are working on their tools, they've got loads of options, Microsoft use their tools, there's uh, open source software, all of these things work differently. The aim of what we're doing is bringing things together to make sure that we're sharing tools, using similar tools so we can collaborate and make things happen. And when I was thinking about this presentation, I was trying to envisage or pick up some way of actually how we changed. And I quite like this photo, the traditional classroom. But then I came across these images, just these links, of how literally we're just grabbing at what we want. We're thinking about where things are, what information, making links between certain things and jumping around. Linking up our teachers to our students by all technology means that they're available. Not focusing on one thing, just taking different resources, putting things together, using the vast skills we've got to try and give our students the opportunity to learn wherever they are, but also learn how to learn and how actually when they move forward, things like using these online courses are just part of what they do and they really go in different ways. So, I think that was an interesting presentation. I was going to ask for you to put some um, questions up online. Uh, as we change the format, we'll come back at the end to hopefully answer any questions. But hopefully I'll give you a little bit of a snippet into how education is changing and has changed and where we are. And then use some thoughts where you might take that in the future. Thank you very much.